uh, will bring up the first speaker of the day uh, is Brother Jean-Marie. He is from the uh, Transalpine Redemptorists in, uh, in the Scottish Islands, the Papastranzi. And today, uh, you've seen them here. Uh, Father Anthony gave a talk from the same order. Father Anthony gave a talk on, Mon on uh, Wednesday. And today, he's going to be talking, talking to us about the three Hail Marys, Brother Jean-Marie. Thank you, John. I'd like to start with uh, praying a Hail Mary for a blessing on the stock. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. My talk today will be about the importance of salvation and the devotion known as the three Hail Marys. It's the continuation of the talk, or rather the completion of it, which was given by Father Anthony. And it is also the solution to the question, how do we save our souls? If devotion to Our Lady is necessary for salvation, as Father Perez said yesterday, then what kind of devotion do we use? This is what I want to talk about today. My Lord Bishops, Reverend Fathers and fellow religious, the message of Our Lady of Fatima has been ignored by many over the last few years. Many have despised Our Lady's words. Many have mocked her and ignored her message. Many have fought energetically against her. And many have dismissed these apparitions as nothing more than the pious imagination of three superstitious children. You too, dear faithful, have this choice today. You can either take up the message of Our Lady of Fatima and make known her requests, or you're free to go home ignoring her requests as so many before you have done. But whatever you do, remember, it will have grave consequences. Keep in mind the reason why Our Lady of came to Fatima. Our Lady does not appear for light reasons. She did not appear in Fatima because she was feeling bored or felt the need to talk to three children. No, she came for a reason that was much more serious than that. She came for a reason that affects each and every one of you sitting here today. She came because sinners go to hell and she came to warn you that you could go there too. It was Our Lady herself who gave the three children the Fatima prayer, which we say each after each decade of the rosary. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls into heaven, especially those in most need of thy mercy. Save us from the fires of hell. We say this every day. Think about it often. Why are we saying this prayer? Hell, my dear friends, is a reality. It is as real as the chair you are sitting on, and it is as real as the air you breathe. You can't see the air, you can't touch it, but it still exists. The fact that hell exists is the truth of the Catholic faith, a dogma that must be believed. One day, we know not when, we know not how, we, all, we will all die, we will be judged, and then heaven or hell forever. Now we've all heard the excuses before. Some will say they believe that hell is just some medieval superstition, and we know better now. We're a lot more intelligent now. After all, we know how to use mobile phones and the internet. Others will say they believe that hell exists, but it's empty. And yet others will say that, oh, I believe hell exists, but it's not empty, only the devil is in there. Yet others say, God is mercy and love itself. I don't believe he could condemn anybody to hell. I believe, says yet another, that everyone is going to heaven. I won't go to hell because I don't believe in hell. Wake up! Who cares what you believe? 
What you believe does not make one tiny difference to the fact that hell exists or that it is eternal. What you believe does not change reality. What you believe does not change anything. It won't make hell disappear like a bad dream. If what you believe does not confirm with reality, then what you believe is false. It is erroneous. It does not matter whether you don't believe in hell because hell believes in you. You are free to believe that your neighbor is a coconut tree that does not change the fact that he is human. You are, f you are, you are free to believe that this pulpit is a coke machine. The reality is that it's made of wood. You may choose to believe that hell is a fairy tale and that nobody goes there. But the truth is that hell is real. The existence of hell is a truth de fide. It's of our holy Catholic faith itself. Many sinners go there and both you and I can go there. The dogma that hell exists it's not, is not some opinion that we are free to take up or not. No, it is a dogma of the Catholic faith. It must be believed. If you don't believe it, we are not Catholics anymore. The fact that hell exists was believed without a doubt for 2,000 years. If you choose not to believe in hell, you choose to go against the belief of every single canonized saint in the church. If you do not believe in hell, you have every single canonized saint against you. You have more than 200 popes against you. You have the entire weight of 2,000 years of Catholic tradition against you. You have Our Lady of Fatima against you, and you have Almighty God himself against you. You even have the Protestants and the Orthodox against you, because even they believe in hell. If hell did not exist, there would, there would be no need for God to become man and die a horrible death on the cross. If you believe that hell doesn't exist, you make a mockery of the death, the life, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The incarnation, the life, the death, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ becomes pointless. This is what the church has always believed, and what the church once believed, we must believe today. St. Paul says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His church is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and the teachings are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Dogma does not change. Dogma does not evolve. It remains constant. It is beyond change. It cannot change. It is as true today as it was 2,000 years ago, and it will be true forever. If we believe something different, than what the church believed 500 years ago. It is not because we have a better understanding today of the Catholic faith than what they had then. No. If we believe something different today than what the church believed, then it is we who are wrong. We do not have a better understanding of the Catholic faith. We have a wrong understanding of the Catholic faith. The belief that hell doesn't exist is a deception of Lucifer. It is diabolical. Make no mistake about that. Now I am well aware that there are many authors, theologians, as well as seminary professors who teach the opposite doctrine. However, let me bring to your attention that not one of them, not one single one of them is a canonized saint. In front of the great fathers and doctors of the church, like St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Alphonsus, St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Augustine, and many others, your average modern theologian and seminary professor is an insignificant dwarf. The writings of St. Alphonsus and St. Thomas Aquinas have been declared by the church to be free from error. There is nothing against faith in any of them, but we can't say the same of these modern theologians. I know what I am saying is a hard teaching to swallow, 
the truth hurts sometimes. But when it concerns the salvation of our immortal souls, the truth must be told. It is the only remedy that will tear the blindfold of lies and deception that the devil has placed around our eyes. The Catholic bishops and priests, especially in the West, either do not believe in hell or they are too embarrassed to preach on hell because they think they will be seen as old-fashioned or medieval. But that is not true. The vast majority of Catholic faithful are hungry for the truths of the Catholic faith. They want to know about these things. And let me assure you, they are not interested in ecumenism, social justice, or enculturation. They are simply not interested in it. All they are interested in is the Catholic faith. That's what they want to know about. And U.S. bishops and priests have the duty and obligation to preach it to them. Because as bishops and priests, we are responsible for the souls of those who are under our care. And on the day of judgment, we will be held accountable for those who are under our care. What says our Lord, does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he suffer the loss of his soul? What good is it if you have all the money in the world and then lose your soul? What good is it if you become rich, if you become famous, if you're honored by men in this life? If you lose your soul, you lose everything. You lose heaven, you lose, you lose eternal life, and you lose God himself, who is our supreme good. And the only thing you gain is hell, eternal death, and a life of indescribable suffering that will never end. Our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus, was a tireless preacher when it came to the salvation of souls. His works, since they have been published, have run into more than 20,000 editions, as Father Anthony has said. While he was on his deathbed, an old man of 91, he was visited by his young nephew, who came to hear a few words of wisdom from this great doctor of the church. St. Alphonsus by now was at death's door. He was a very sick man. To move was very difficult and to speak almost impossible. Yet he beckoned his nephew to draw near to him and whispered three words into his ear that would change his life forever. Just three whispered words. Save your soul. Save your soul. This is what all the teaching and writing of St. Alphonsus boiled down to. Just three words. Save your soul. For nothing else matters. Nothing. It doesn't matter whether you're a bishop or a beggar, a priest or a pauper, or a lord or a leper. Nothing matters. The only thing that matters is that you save your soul. You don't have to climb to the top of some high mountain to speak to some guru up there to ask him what the meaning of life is. If you want to know what the meaning of life is, this is it. Our entire life here on earth, this whole life is a test for us. Either we will save our souls and merit eternal life, or we will lose our souls and be damned forever. The whole of our life revolves around this great truth, heaven or hell forever. No matter who we are, there are two paths we can choose to, talk, to walk in order to get through this life. As our Lord said, either we can choose the narrow path or the broad path to salvation. The choice is ours. Either we will be saved or we will be lost. And if we are lost, we will be lost forever. And no, there won't be any excuses. There won't be anybody to blame. You won't be able to say it's because of his fault. You won't be able to point fingers at anyone. No, if we are lost, it's because of our own fault. Through our own fault. How was St. Francis Xavier able to convert so many millions of souls in India? What was the secret of his success? What was the reason for his great zeal? What did he have that you don't? The answer is found in the moment of his conversion 
And this moment of his conversion came about because St. Ignatius of Loyola constantly whispered into his ear the words of our Lord, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world if he lose, if he suffer the loss of his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? These words penetrated the soul of St. Francis Xavier so deeply that he was completely convinced about the importance of saving his soul and he was thus able to convince millions of others about the necessity of saving their souls too. And God himself has set his seal of, of, of approval on what St. Francis believed and on the doctrine which he preached. God himself has set his seal of approval on the doctrine of the importance of salvation of souls. And the seal of approval is visible even today in the incorrupt body of St. Francis Xavier and can be seen by anyone in Goa. Nearly 500 years later, St. Francis Xavier's incorrupt body continues to preach the importance of the salvation of souls. Listen to what St. Francis had to say. This is St. Francis Xavier speaking, not me. He said that the only good to be obtained in this world is salvation, and the only evil to be feared is damnation. St. Augustine, along with St. Alphonsus, calls this thought of eternity, of salvation, of heaven and hell, of judgment, the great thought. This great thought of eternity has inspired innumerable men and women from all walks of life to turn away from the deceit of the devil, the flesh and the world, and to flee into the desert, into monasteries and into cloisters to do penance. The Benedictine order itself can count 25 emperors and 70 kings who gave up their thrones to join this order. They had everything and yet they gave it up. Were they mad? Were they deluded? Were they deceived? Were they stupid? No, it was none of these things. On the contrary, they realized the importance of saving their soul. They realized the eternity of hell and its pains and torments. And they realized how easy it was to go there. No, they were not mad and they were not stupid. And the whole world will see this on the day of judgment. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, says St. Paul. Why does he say with fear and trembling? It was because he knew that hell exists and that many go there. And he warns you, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, lest you go there too. There is no free ticket to heaven. We have to work for it. As he said, faith without works is dead. If we are all going to heaven, where is the need to fear and tremble? It's simple logic. St. Philip Neri says that the person who does not attend to his eternal salvation is a fool. And Holy Scripture tells us the number of fools is infinite. And you can see that in today's world. How many people do you know are trying to work out their salvation? The great Saint Teresa of Avila used to say over and over again, one soul one eternity, for if the soul is lost, all is lost, and if it is lost, it is lost for eternity. There is no error greater than the error of neglecting one's salvation and losing one's soul. Every other error has a remedy. If you lose some property, you may be able to regain it. If you make a mistake, you may be able to correct it. If you lose a friend, you might find another one. But if we lose our souls, it is lost forever. There is no remedy, there is no cure, there is no physician, there is no medicine, there is no mercy, there is no pardon, and there is no second chance. Nothing remains for us but to weep, and to weep for all eternity. 
hell exists, whether we believe in it or not. Nothing is more important then than saving our souls. How then do we go about working out a salvation? How do we accomplish this most important business of saving our souls? Our Lady at Fatima urges her faithful children to take up the powerful weapons she has given us, the rosary and the scapula. The importance of saying the rosary and scapula cannot be stressed enough. And one would indeed be neglecting the salvation of their soul if they neglected these devotions. But it is not of these devotions that I wish to speak today. Our Holy Father, St. Alphonsus, was one of the greatest Marian saints of all time. As a doctor of the church, and there are only 30 doctors of the church among all the saints, as a doctor of the church, he's called by innumerable titles, by several titles, sorry. He's called the most zealous doctor because his zeal for the salvation of souls was unmatched. He's called the most useful doctor because everything he wrote was for the fostering of the Christian life and for the salvation of souls. But there is another title that the church could give St. Alphonsus. He's also called the doctor of prayer. He's called the doctor of prayer because he knew how to pray and he knew how to teach others to pray to save their souls. Listen to what St. Alphonsus had to say if you want to know how to save your soul. He who prays, he says, is certain to be saved and he who doesn't pray is certain to be damned. All his works, all his writings, all his teaching can be summed up into four points. Firstly, as I have just said, he who prays will be saved and he who doesn't pray will be damned. Secondly, every grace comes to us from the hand of God, but none of them reach us except through the hands of Mary. Thirdly, true devotion to Mary is an absolutely necessary condition and efficacious means to obtain the graces we need, as Father Perez said yesterday. And finally, a true child of Mary can never be lost. How did St. Alphonsus pray to save his soul? What devotion did he have to Our Lady? Here's what he did. He made a vow to say 15 decades of the rosary every day. He fasted on bread and water every Saturday in Our Lady's honor. He prayed the chaplet of the seven sorrows of Our Lady every single day. He preached on her glories every Saturday. He wrote a book on the glories of Mary, which some of you already have here. He said a Hail Mary before every single new action that he undertook. He said a Hail Mary every time the clock struck the quarter hour. Now we could go on and on about St. Alphonsus' prayer and fasting and mortification. But is this what St. Alphonsus recommended for us in order to be saved? No. What did he recommend as the best means to save our souls and be devoted to Our Lady? Did he recommend that we fast on bread and water, sleep on a bed of nails, scourge ourselves to blood? No. He recommended a devotion to Mary that was small but powerful, the devotion of the three Hail Marys. And what does this devotion consist of? It consists of saying three Hail Marys as soon as we get up from bed, the first action of the day, the first thing we do on rising, and three Hail Marys just before we go to bed, the last thing we do. And in, bet in between each Hail Mary, we add the invocation, by thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this day or this night from mortal sin. By the recitation of the three Hail Marys, we are promised three signal graces that are fundamental to the practice of the spiritual life. They are the happiness of possessing sanctifying grace or soon recovering it the victory over the vice of impurity, and three, the grace of final perseverance. I'd like to explain these graces 
what exactly do we mean by these three graces which we get by the three Hail Marys? Firstly, the happiness of possessing sanctifying grace or soon recovering it. You don't need to be a serial killer or a rapist to go to hell. All it takes is one single, unconfessed, mortal sin. Now, if you don't really know what mortal sins are, there's a book outside called An Examination of Conscience for Adults. It's available outside. All it takes is therefore one single, unconfessed, mortal sin. We therefore ought to take care that we are always in a state of grace. St. Alphonsus recommends the devotion of the three Hail Marys as the best means of remaining in a state of sanctifying grace. Now you may say, what what authority does St. Alphonsus have? Who exactly was St. Alphonsus? St. Alphonsus is the patron saint of moral theologians and confessors. The sacred penitentiary has already declared that in the field of moral theology, no one has greater authority than St. Alphonsus. St. Alphonsus has the same authority in moral theology that St. Thomas Aquinas has in dogmatic theology. In his book, Homo Apostolicus for Confessors, he says that, I quote, one must never fail to suggest to all penitents, be they devout or sinners, the devotion to the Blessed Virgin by engaging them particularly to recommend themselves morning and night by the recitation of the three Hail Marys so as to be preserved from mortal sin. It is difficult for a soul to persevere in the grace of God and save himself without having a special devotion to the Mother of God. But not only does the the devotion of the three Hail Marys preserve us from mortal sin, It also helps us to recover the state of sanctifying grace if we are living in mortal sin. Do you know anyone living a sinful life, some penitent, some friend of yours struggling with sin? St. Alphonsus tells you to recommend to him the devotion of the three Hail Marys. Only two things can happen. Either he will give up sin or he will give up the three Hail Marys. Nothing is more important then than to say it every day without fail, with perseverance no matter what. If you're already half asleep in bed and realize that we haven't said the three Hail Marys, get out of bed, get on your knees and say the three Hail Marys. If one is physically, physically capable of doing so, one ought to say this devotion on one's knees. In our monastery, we all say this lying prostrate on the floor. Make the effort to get out of bed and kneel down. It's a very small penance in comparison to the great graces promised. Now you may ask, does this really work? Do sinners really give up sin just by saying three Hail Marys morning and night? Now I haven't been a religious for very long, but I've already come across many people, not only in the monastery, but in the world, who have told me that if it wasn't for the three Hail Marys, they would never be able to give up sin. They had tried everything, but nothing worked. And I can honestly say that in my conversion too, it played a huge role. But it doesn't matter what I say. Listen to what St. Alphonsus, the patron saint of moral theologians and confessors, and the doctor of prayer says. He says, The help of Mary is necessary for the conservation of grace and necessary for conversion. This help is assured even to sinners, provided that there is goodwill and recourse to Mary, the mother of God. The great Jesuit saint, St. John Berkmans, on his deathbed, when asked what devotion to Mary, excuse me, when asked what devotion to Mary was required for salvation, said, to be pleasing to Mary, the smallest thing suffices as long as one is faithful in it. The small devotion of the three Hail Marys is very pleasing to Our Lady. And she will obtain for us the graces promised, provided we are faithful 
in reciting it morning and night, day after day, week after week, year after year, until we die. The second grace promised by the three Hail Marys is victory over the vice of impurity. What do we mean by the vice of impurity? That's victory over sins of the sixth and ninth commandments. We are told that 99% of those who go to hell go to hell because of, this, of sins of impurity. And Our Lady of Fatima herself confirmed this when she said that more souls go to hell because of the sins of the flesh than for any other reason. The world today is a sewer of Im 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 immorality and impurity. Everywhere we go, everywhere we look, we are confronted with impurity probably not seen since the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. What chance have young people today with so much pornography, so many bad examples of bad marriages, concubinage, seen all over the television, internet, on the streets they live in. If it wasn't for the sin of impurity, 99% of the souls in hell wouldn't be there. St. Alphonsus promises you that you can overcome all temptations to this vice by the practice of the three Hail Marys. Make this devotion known amongst your parishioners, amongst the youth, for without this devotion, this powerful devotion to Our Lady, they are fighting a losing battle. Listen to what St. Alphonse says in one of his books addressed to priests. He says, The means par excellence of keeping chastity is devotion to Mary. The best way of captivating the favor of Mary is to honor her purity. The most efficacious means of honoring her purity is to practice the devotion of the three Hail Marys. But this devotion is not only useful to preserve chastity and avoid temptations against purity, it is also the best means to bring about a lasting and sincere conversion, even when we are talking about sinners who are addicted to this vice and those who are completely powerless to overcome its attractions. Listen to what he says again. If there be one among you who finds himself plunged into the mire of impurity, I do not want to discourage him, but I say to him, make haste to get yourselves out of this infernal rotting flesh. Remove the occasion of sin and then recommend yourself to Mary, mother of purity. Each day pray to her that she deliver you from this vice and in the morning upon you rising from sleep and, the, and in the evening before going to bed. Never ever miss saying the three Hail Marys in honor of her purity. And he recommends this even as a penance in the confessional for confessors. As I said earlier, I haven't been wearing this habit for very long, but I have still seen enough of examples to know that the three Hail Marys is the greatest weapon we have when it comes to fighting temptations to impurity. Just a little over a month ago, a young man I knew in Sydney came up to me and told me that he was able to live a chaste life for the last two years because of the practice of the three Hail Marys. He was unable to do this before that. The third grace promised, the grace of final perseverance. What do we mean by that? Now this is the third and most important of the graces that we receive by the recitation of the three Hail Marys. The whole question of our salvation, whether we go to heaven or to hell, depends on the moment of death. If we die in a state of grace, we are saved. But if we die in a state of mortal sin, we are lost forever. Everything then depends on the grace of final perseverance. Our Lord himself says in the Gospel of St. Matthew, He that shall persevere to the end shall be saved. St. Bonaventure says that the crown in heaven is only given to those who persevere. You need to persevere to get your crown. St. Jerome says that many begin well, but few persevere. Many are called, but few are chosen. 
the great Saint Bernard warns us that to the, to the one who begins a reward is only promised. It is only actually given to the one who finishes, to the one who perseveres. It is not enough to run for the prize, says Saint Alphonsus. You need to run until you win it. If any one of you thinks he is safe and secure and that his place in heaven is assured, call to mind the sad example of Judas. He was an apostle, one of the twelve handpicked by our Lord. He probably witnessed all our Lord's miracles, and yet he fell. Read the lives of the early desert fathers in Egypt. Some of them barely slept two hours a day. They prayed constantly. They ate scarcely a handful of food every day. And they did more penance in one month than all of us will do in a lifetime. They even worked miracles, and yet they fell. They lost their place in heaven forever. How then do we persevere? How do we get the grace of final perseverance? St. Alphonsus gives this warning to everyone, no matter whether he's the Pope himself or a simple layman. He says, I quote, In order to obtain the grace of final perseverance, a particular devotion to Mary is important. To her who is called the mother of perseverance, he who does not have the special devotion to the Blessed Virgin will persevere with difficulty. Because as St. Bernard assures us, all God's graces, especially the grace of final perseverance, which is the greatest of all graces, comes to us through Mary. Child of Mary, child of heaven, he who has a true devotion to Mary will be helped by Mary at the hour of death. He who is helped by Mary at this decisive hour will make a holy death and will be saved for all eternity. Our Lady does not ask for much, but she does ask for a good will and constancy. We must be constant in our devotion to Our Lady. And we must also have a good will that is the right intention of giving up sin. This devotion is so small and easy that it can be taught to anyone. Even a child can say it. And no time is not an excuse. It takes less than two minutes to say the three Hail Marys. Everybody has the time to say the three Hail Marys. One may ask, did St. Alphonsus invent these, these devotions? Where did he get these promises from? Where did he get the three Hail Marys from? No, he did not invent it. It was given to St. Mechtel in the sixth century and later on to St. Gertrude. From then on, it has been taken up preached and practiced by innumerable saints. Notably amongst these are Saint Leonard of Port Morris and the great Saint Anthony of Padua, who preached this devotion with great zeal and was instrumental in making it known in his time. And God has shown how pleased he was with this. Many centuries later, the body of Saint Anthony has turned to dust but his tongue and his vocal cords, which preach the three Hail Marys, remains incorrupt to this day, like the body of St. Francis. This again is God's seal of approval on the three Hail Marys. St. John Bosco was another one who practiced this devotion and recommended it to, to his children, the Salesians. You could ask them, they've surely heard of it. The church herself has approved the devotion of the three Hail Marys, Many popes, for example, Leo XIII, Benedict XV, and the last pope saint in 500 years, St. Pius X, made himself the faithful apostle of the devotion of the three Hail Marys. Not only did he proclaim his personal love for this devotion, but he also enriched it with precious indulgences and recommended it to bishops and priests, asking for its diffusion among the faithful. Now there are two errors that we can have about this devotion. Either we can say it is too little or it is too much. In our pride, we may look upon it as something so little that it is not worthy of our time and effort. After all, we say many more prayers, don't we? We say our rosary, we go to mass, our bravery. 
but call to mind that there have been many more before you who have said a lot more many prayers than you and even they didn't persevere to the end. Keep in mind that this devotion has been recommended not only by the patron saint of moral theologians and confessors, but also the doctor of prayer himself, St. Alphonsus. This devotion may seem small, but it is small like the mustard seed mentioned by our Lord in the Gospels. If we say the three Hail Marys faithfully, not only will it strengthen and increase our devotion to the Mother of God, but it will also bring the greatest fruit of all, the grace of final perseverance and eternal life. Truly then can the three Hail Marys be called the mustard seed of devotion to Our Lady and salvation. It is also possible for some of us to fall into the opposite error and, then, and think that, is, that it is too much of an effort to say the three Hail Marys. And I've heard this from a few friends of mine who live in a state of sin. The answer to that is simple. If you can't even do something as small as the three Hail Marys, then frankly, you don't deserve heaven. Let me sum up in short. Hell exists and many sinners go there. It is a truth of our Catholic faith. It exists whether we choose to believe in it or not. Nothing then is more important than our eternal salvation. He who prays to St. Alphonsus will be saved. He who doesn't pray will be damned. All graces come to us from God, but through the hands of Mary. It is therefore necessary to have a true devotion to Mary. And the three Hail Marys, if done with goodwill and with constancy, obtains for us the following graces. The conservation or recovery of sanctifying grace, victory over the vice of impurity, and the grace of final perseverance. Inasmuch as it is in your power, make this devotion known from the pulpit, in your newsletter, in the confessional, and you will see the fruits of it yourself. You won't need me to convince you. You will see the fruits of it yourself in your own experience. Listen to this true story. It was told to us to one of our fathers. I am 75 years old, father, he said to me. I have had many pains during my life. I have been exposed to many dangers where others have been shipwrecked. But in my old age, I have the sweet confidence of never having committed a single mortal sin since my first communion. On that unforgettable day, never forgotten, my mother held me tight to her bosom for a long while, then asked me to promise her, my earthly mother, and to marry my heavenly mother, to faithfully say every day, three Hail Marys, morning and night. I made the promise, and by God's grace, I was faithful to my promise. The memory of my mother, the thought of my first communion, the protection of Mary, to these I attribute the greatest happiness I have just told you. Now I know that it is very easy for whatever I have said to go into one year and out the next. It is also very easy to start the three Hail Marys today and to give it up two days later. That won't do. Therefore now I am not telling you, I am not asking you, but I am begging you, each and every one of you sitting here, go to Our Lady, go to her. She's offering you a great grace. Don't reject her. Go to her and promise her that you will recite the three Hail Marys every day morning and night, until the day you die. If you promise her this, she promises you heaven. Don't reject her. Thank you.